So, um, oh wow, look at this timer there. That's great. Somebody better start it because otherwise I'll keep going. So, uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you. I, I, I have to I have to admit that I was talking to Ray Baxter just a minute ago, and um, I'm always worried when I come to meetings and I know kind of too many people in the room um, because, uh, as was said earlier, uh, public health does have a tendency to talk to ourselves, and um, you know some of this work really does require being very intentional about not talking just to ourselves. Um, but I, on the other hand, to have the Institute of Medicine focusing on an agenda around momentum or movement building um, was just too good to pass up. I mean, it was just, it's too enticing. In fact, I was supposed to be on Skype, and when I saw, when I finally focused on the agenda and saw all the folks that were going to be talking and participating, I said, I just got to be there because, uh, you know, I hope to learn a lot from what's happening in both the uh, practice and in the minds of many people that are in this room. And it's also most nice to know that there's some people remotely watching, and hopefully they are not all public health people. They Hopefully some of you are people from other sectors who think that we're strange, and now uh, you're learning a little bit more about us. Um, so I'm going to talk relatively quickly, um, and I really look forward to more of the interaction because that is where I learn, so I'm being very selfish about that. Um, the work of the California Endowment, I think, is informed by this notion that health is political. And uh, when I say that, you know, I intentionally say small p political, and the definition of, of politics, or at least one definition, is the struggle over the allocation of scarce and precious social goods. And I like that definition because it's, it highlights a couple of issues and factors that we have to focus on when designing public, a public health practice. Um, one is it's a struggle. So, you know, people are exercising their interests, people are coming armed with resources with an intention of winning. And so, in a struggle, you have to arm yourself appropriately with data, you have to arm yourself with uh, information, you have to use your relationships, you have to use your people power um, in any way that you can. Um, there's also a result of that struggle, and that's the allocation of scarce and precious social goods. And when we talk about scarce and precious social goods, in most instances, particularly when you're talking about low-income communities, you're not talking about esoteric things. You're talking about things like a grocery store or a park. And recognizing that the uh, struggle um, for something as basic, a basic amenity like a park or a bike lane or a grocery store, is something that our low-income communities are really, when they're contending with all of the stressors in their lives on a day-to-day -day basis, they're not well armed to participate in that battle. So if we're talking about movement, um, we have to think about what are the key ingredients for those of us in public health who are actually trying to fuel a movement fuel a movement and fuel the kind of change that's necessary to propel a movement. So at the California Endowment, and I'll talk about this in the, towards the end of the, the slides in a minute, we have these things we call the drivers of change. These are essentially the core capacities that we think we need to build in communities to arm communities to better participate in these political deliberations. And so if you're talking about movement, you know up front that power matters. And we have to figure out ways to actually create social, political, and economic power in a critical mass of people in these communities so that they can more effectively represent their interests in these political decision-making venues. We also know that participation matters, and this has been spoken to by a number of the previous presenters. Diverse participation matters, not just the same voices. In our case, we're concerned about the undocumented in California. We're concerned about ex-felons. We're concerned about LGBTQ. We're concerned about um, boys and men of color. Facilitating opportunities for these stigmatized populations, these devalued populations, is critical to equity. We also know that to build a movement narrative as we heard from Marshall Gans and others this morning, matters, and it matters a lot. And that narrative has to incorporate some of the existing values that shape our thinking in this country around health. Personal responsibility does matter. It's necessary, but
but not sufficient. Access to health care does matter. Necessary, not sufficient. But if you de define a narrative which says these things don't matter, you turn off your population. So you have to meet people where they are, and you have to expand their understanding of what health is. Resources matter. And particularly the ability, and this is one of the things I didn't know until I got into philanthropy. I was a public health guy, so I figured everything was about you know, data and, and giving speeches. Um, when I got into philanthropy, I found out that uh, you know, money loves money. And so uh, Mildred talked earlier about the uh, Fresh Food Financing Initiative that you know, originated, originated in, in Philadelphia. Um, at the California Endowment, with uh, PolicyLink's help, we created our own Fresh Works Fund, a private um, uh, fund to invest in building grocery stores in low-income communities. Our partners at Kaiser are in it. A number of partners around the state and around the country are in it. We put in $30 million of our own dollars, and within 18 months, we had $300 million uh, to build grocery stores in low-income communities. I, I never thought that that was possible. I, I was like, what? Say what? Um, but money loves money. And the thing about money loving money is that nobody really wants to be the first one in. So if you're willing to take that first risk, you can get a lot of people to follow you in. And so what we do with our money is that we buy down other people's risk. And that allows us to expand and leverage the resources of the private sector to be able to do those public health things that we recognize are important to do. So we need to, in a movement, we need to leverage other forms of capital. Okay, so this is what the CDC says health equity is. When all people have the opportunity to attain their full health potential, no one is disadvantaged um, from achieving this potential because of their social position or other socially determined circumstances. It's a definition that I love. I'm glad CDC has come to it, and I know that there's a secret cabal within CDC that's been advancing this for years, and finally uh, people are listening to them, and I say, go, girls. Uh, <clears throat> but when you're trying to advance health equity, and this is my big worry, that health equity or equity has become the new diversity. And it's really not attending to the issues of power and injustice and the historical legacy of discrimination. And if you just make equity diversity, then it's just about essentially, you know, translating information at the doctor's office and making sure that, you know, you do outreach in the right communities. All of that's important, don't get me wrong, but if you're talking about equity, you have to understand the history of how we got to the status quo. This is not a mistake. This is the result of a set of intentional policies and practices. And then if we ignore that, we can't undo that. We're just gonna keep making the same mistakes. If you're talking about equity, you also have to give voice and power to those that are most impacted by the inequitable conditions. They have to drive the bus. You heard. Marshall Gantz talk about agency. Agency is good for your health. The ability to control as much as possible the things that are happening to you, the things around you, that gives you a sense of health and hope and a future. And many of our low-income communities, most people don't have that sense of control. And they feel that they're set upon constantly by forces outside of their control. And when that's happening to you, you're much more likely to smoke or drink or drive without a seat belt and you also have physiological changes that occur in your body that are essentially a process of premature aging or weathering. And we know this, we know this in the science, yet our policy doesn't really address those issues, what we know. Okay, so I never go anywhere without a picture of a map in my pocket. This is Alameda County by census tract, and here we just calculated life expectancy by neighborhood and found this wide differential, which many of you know in your various communities. We know it's not just Alameda County. This is Cuyahoga County, Cleveland. Thank you, Terry Allen. Uh, this is Baltimore, Maryland. That's LA. This is uh, uh, King County, Seattle. So we know that this phenomenon exists pretty much everywhere we decide to study it. Understanding how to undo this is impossible to do without understanding the history of how it was created. And so at the California Endowment, we spend a lot of time trying to get this in people's faces. And we're actually kind of obnoxious about it. Um, at APHA, the year before last, we actually festooned uh, the Metreon building with this image. Um, basically, like, here it is, explain it, help us change it. And we think that that's part of the role of public health, is to essentially change the narrative around health. 
And to do that, you have to make people uncomfortable. You have to have people see the invisible realities that are occurring throughout our society. You have to make the invisible visible uh, to people. And that's part of changing the narrative. Let's talk about what's really happening. OK, so why are these neighborhoods struggling in the way that they are? It's because health is political. And politics and policies shape neighborhoods and resources. OK, so I'm a lawyer. And when I was in Alameda County, I became very fascinated with this idea of why our neighborhoods were constructed the way that they are. So we w actually went back and researched some legal cases. And we found, uh, without much searching, quite frankly, um, some very interesting, um, relatively recent historical phenomena. This is a case in Alameda County about a Latino couple that bought a house. Um, and the neighbors came with a cake and said, welcome to the neighborhood. And they said, wait a second, you're Latinos. Uh, give us our cake back. And instead, they called their lawyers, and they sued the Latino couples. This is in the 19, late 1940s. And said that we have a racially restrictive covenant on this property, in fact, on the whole neighborhood. And uh, by that covenant, you're not allowed to live in your house. So they took that to court. And the judge, uh, Alameda County Superior Court judge, said, you know, the neighbors are right. Now, these neighbors have been injured by the fact that these Latinos have moved in. And so I'm going to rule that these Latinos cannot live, own, or occupy their house for a period of 20 years, because these white neighbors are irreparably harmed by the presence of these Latinos. The clause that was in that um, racially restrictive covenant read in part, no person or persons of the Mexican race. I love these things. They're just so funny. What's the Mexican race? I, I, I don't know what it is. Or other than the Caucasian race, Caucasian in capitals, because it's important, right? <laughs> Except that this uh, shall use or occupy any building or any lot, except that this covenant shall not prevent occupancy by domestic servants of a different race domiciled with an owner, tenant, or occupant thereof. We found a ton of these racially restrictive covenants all throughout Alameda County. In fact, I have had three houses in Alameda County. I'm not supposed to live in any of them. And these things, by law, for those of you who know a little bit about property law, run in perpetuity with the land. And in, in fact, they are essentially not enforceable, but still present on most of these properties uh, in our communities. This one I really like. This was one that we found. This is basically no person or any other per or of any race other than the Caucasian race. And then they go on to say, the foregoing restrictions as to non-Caucasians include, but is not limited to, persons who are natives of the continent of Africa, the continent of Asia, and the islands of Japan, who are Negro, Mongolian, or Malayan descent. I mean, they were really just trying to cover their bases here. You know, like, I don't know what you are, but you're probably from one of these continents. <laughs> so we have to understand that this is not a neutral playing field. There's a legacy that created these neighborhoods. And so to say that we just have to work on policy is to ignore what created the status quo. And if you ignore that, and you ignore the fact that this was basically created by a set of beliefs a narrative that devalued certain populations, tried to restrict and restrain access to important health resources for certain populations by virtue of the fact that they were considered to be less worthy of these resources. If you ignore that, you're not talking about health equity. OK, and this was federal policy. I mean, this is the Federal Housing Administration's underwriting manual in 1938, which basically said it's necessary that property shall continue necessary that property shall continue to be occupied by the same social and racial groups. And we see this. You don't have to go too far to find this all throughout federal policy. So there was a historical narrative that talked about, um, essentially, that used tactics like redlining, racially restrictive covenants, land ownership rights, uh, Medicaid policy, which is, you know, we can get to that. I think the Affordable Care Act is a wonderful thing. But the fact that we're cramming a whole bunch of people into Medicaid now which is a system that was already on life support um, and is essentially, it's a sub-level of health care for a population. I think that we have to question, is that equity? I mean, it is better than the status quo, but how much better? And why are we still separating people based on their income? What does that say about us as Americans? Uh, Social Security policy, which excluded domestic workers, agricultural workers, affordable housing policy, practices of racial segregation, inner cities, barrios, reservations, Chinatowns, and present 
practices, including predatory lending, immigration policy, incarceration policy, school push-out policy, gay marriage. I'm just listing a few of them. The basic theme, the common denominator here is the notion of exclusion, that some people aren't worthy of the full benefits of citizenship. And therefore, we need policies that separate them by their status, demark them as being less worthy. That's what these policies say. This narrative creates people that are marginalized on the fringes. And if we want to engage in a movement around health equity, we have to change that narrative. That narrative traumatizes people. That narrative isolates people. That narrative leads to internalized depression and self-hate. That narrative sidelines valuable human capital that this country needs to be successful in the 21st century. That narrative is what creates a limited opportunity structures for this kid who, but for the will of God or whomever, is me. That's a kid in East Baltimore growing up in circumstances with very constrained opportunities. And we did that to that kid. And to pretend that this is just about, you know, oh, these are sort of unhealthy policies. This was intentional. This kid was devalued systematically. If we're concerned about health equity, we have to think about what we owe this kid. What is the legacy of our decisions, our collective decisions, that created this constrained set of opportunities for this kid? OK, so in our work, we're trying to change this narrative. We need a new narrative of inclusion. And we use this framework not because it explains the universe. And I was laughing before when uh, somebody put up a framework and said that, you know, uh, I guess, I think, was it Robert Wood Johnson? Or somebody put up a framework and said, you know, there's blood shed over these things. This is another one where there's a lot of blood shed. <laughs> and um, I like it because it's, really, it's not a model. That's what people get excited about. They're like, well, this arrow should be going that way, and this one should loop back around and touch that one. And I'm like, you know, it's, it's not meant to explain the universe. It's just meant to show us a landscape of opportunities for intervention and to think about how these interventions can actually lead to interrupting this downstream cascade of events that leads to these communities that are systematically bereft of opportunity and, and meaningful health um, amenities. So the downstream part of it is basically the medical model. And I, you know, I, I like to say to people that I spent $100,000 to go to Johns Hopkins Medical School. That's what I learned. So I gave you a $100,000 education in five seconds. Um, and it's basically that, you know, premature death is driven by a higher burden of disease, which is driven by a set of bad behaviors and a set of risks. And so our job in the healthcare world is really to try to avert death, try to reduce the burden of disease, and try to change people's behaviors. And that's pretty much it. And we spend $2.8 trillion a year trying to do that. Um, and I'm oversimplifying because I'm, you know, we've got folks like Kaiser and others that are doing incredible work at trying to actually redefine how the healthcare system thinks about health. Um, but upstream, we have these opportunities that we are not investing terribly heavily in. And we have these neighborhoods, these communities. And it's not just neighborhoods and communities. You also have populations that are uh, not geographically concentrated, that are stigmatized nonetheless, like gays and lesbians and the disabled. Um, and others. Um, so when I say community, I'm talking only out of convenience about a physical place. Um, but think about community as broader than just where you live. It's also where you work. It's also kind of who you have access to in terms of resources and, and opportunities. And we recognize that you have communities that are on life support intentionally. Why is that? It's driven by a set of policies and practices that institutions have adopted, or the lack of policies in the face of abject need. Why is that? Because there's a narrative. There's a set of isms, historically, that have created, essentially, the undergirding, the stories that allow for policies that discriminate uh, between people. And that creates consequences. So we say the world of health disparities lives downstream. It's an important thing to try to mitigate. Um, but if you really want to think about how to get underneath those, you have to look at health inequities, which live upstream, and there are opportunities to intervene there. You can take the word health out of that and just talk about inequities producing disparities. Or if you're a simple-minded country bumpkin like myself, you talk about conditions producing consequences. 
And we live in the world of consequence management or damage control, and it's expensive, uh, and it's unending. And it's important. We have to figure out how do we address some of the conditions and do it in an organized, evidence-based, intelligent, rational way that takes into consideration the historical patterns and legacies that were created by a set of beliefs, a strong narrative in this country that is about isms. Okay, so very simply, behavior, bad behavior produces bad disease, presumably, uh, which produces premature death. That's the medical model. And the socio-ecological model, which is much more focused on society and less on individuals, talks basically about a set of bad societal behaviors, a set of dis discriminatory beliefs that led to a set of policies and practices that produced communities, defined broadly, uh, on life support and struggling to find basic health uh, resources. We have interventions to prevent death. We call them emergency rooms. We have interventions to prevent disease. We call them clinics. We have interventions to try to change behavior. We call that health education. We don't have great interventions for communities that are on life support. We're working on that. We and we're learning from the community development field and others that have been trying to do this for a long time. But we need to figure this out in public health. We need to get into that game because it has profound implications on health outcomes. Our practice is called building power in place. We think that that's insufficient. We also have to look at the policies and practices that create those conditions in those places and engage aggressively in policy advocacy, uh, looking at health in all policies, looking at data uh, displayed and arrayed in different ways, like um, using GIS mapping so that more people can understand the health consequences and the patterns of disease in communities. We think that that's not sufficient. We think that we also have to look at these biased beliefs and change the narrative around that, which means different stories and different storytellers. We need to broaden who's talking about health, who's the important voice on health. Is it just the guy with a stethoscope around his neck talking about the latest cholesterol drug? I'm not saying that that guy is not important, but there are a lot of other things that shape health that we don't seem to have the same respect for the expertise that's telling us about what's happening uh, in these communities. Now, in our work, we've, uh, I started off with this notion of the drivers of change. These are the things that we think we need to invest in capacity-wise in our communities to build the kind of power that will fuel uh, movements. So we've taken these three upstream um, leverage points and the strategies that we think are necessary to leverage uh, those points in our communities. Um, and we call them the drivers of change. Our goal is to create a new narrative which is about inclusion and sustainability. We want to actually leverage uh, work in the environmental movement, leverage work in other movements that are concerned about uh, sustainability. We think that inclusion is the future. We think that policy links approach around you know, equity is the only sustainable, meaningful, uh, effective strategy for the 21st century is critical. This is about all of us. We also think that health in all policies is, although I don't like that term, quite frankly. I never liked it. It sounds presumptuous. Um, I think we have to come up with another way of referring to it because it, I think it makes people think that we think health is the most important thing for everything at all times for all people. Um, well, I do personally think that. Um, I don't think others appreciate hearing me say that. Um, so we need to think about ways of looking at the health impacts of non-health policies. And we need to create uh, and maintain resilient and transformed communities, places where people really do have hope, where they really do have opportunities. And it's today we have not done a good job of that. Uh, you know, we can all walk into communities, and without even having to look at a map, you know what's happening in these communities in terms of hope and in terms of opportunities, particularly in the eyes of young children. Look at kids the ages of around 13 to 15. Just look in their eyes in communities, and you start to see this light turning off in these kids because they are honest. They see this constrained environmental landscape. They see that they have limited opportunities and they start internalizing that. They start getting angry and they start acting out. They start acting in the short term because we did this to them. They didn't do that. They didn't create these conditions. We did this to them and we owe them something and that's what equity is about. 
So as I said, that th this is where the so-called drivers of change come from. This is what we're trying to invest in in our communities. Not because we think that it's a secret recipe. It's because we think that we don't see anything else to invest in that actually makes sense. You have to build the capacity of people to participate in these decision-making venues in a way that they can actually assert their interests. Because getting a park is a political act. Getting a grocery store is a political act. And I say small p political. It's not Democrat, Republican. It's about participation. We live in a democracy. We operate under the belief structure that we get better results when people participate in democratic processes. Health is political and it depends on democratic participation. So we have to foster that kind of participation if we want to improve health. So lastly, this is, this is what we're investing in. Building resident power, we're hiring organizers, people like Doran Schrantz, who you're going to hear from, who's one of my heroes, um, who just doesn't waste time trying to get all hung up on whether your data is better than my data. She's trying to figure out how to build meaningful power so people can participate effectively in these decisions that have dramatic impacts on their lives. We're funding in California, over the 10 years, we'll probably fund $75 million in, in organizing in our communities, probably more if things continue to go as well as they've been going, because we believe that this is an important health strategy. It's not sufficient, though. We actually have to get the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker to come together across their various sectors, out of their silos, and work together to try to find common cause, try to find purpose that they all share and resources that they can leverage to try to achieve something collectively. So we're, we're funding staffed and resource tables in all of our communities to bring together this broad spectrum of multi-sectoral actors to be able to work together to try to uh, find a better solutions. We also think, and you heard a little bit earlier from Marshall Gans and some others, that leadership matters. Leadership matters, leadership matters, particularly youth leadership. Because young people won't sit around in a room like this for three hours. Um, they would have already been up on the stage throwing things over saying, you old people, get out of the way. Um, and we recognize that that's an incredible force to try to harness that, to try to make change. And it's also motivating for us old people. We love to see that kind of energy. We want to leverage partnerships, as I said. You want to get the private money to do uh, sort of these, what we consider to be public health purposes. Um, not as hard as I thought. Um, it may be just because there's a lot of private money parked out there now looking for ways to invest. And if we can leverage that in ways that are kind of win-win, um, that is very good for our efforts. And it also contributes to movement building. And finally, we need to change the narrative. Um, and I can't, I can't say this enough, because uh, I come from a long public health background, and one of the things public health does very well is present data. Not terribly accessibly, um, but prevents data, uh, presents data, um, generates data, studies things, puts them in these journals that nobody reads, um, and puts them in tables and pie charts that nobody understands. Um, what we don't do well in public health is actually translate that into some kind of compelling narrative. And we heard about that uh, all this morning, so I won't dwell on that too much. We think that's the recipe for building healthy communities. We think that that's a health equity practice. We hope, at least in our practice, to network our, we have 14 sites across the state of California in which we're spending about a billion dollars over the next 10 years. We hope to create a platform to network these sites to actually help potentiate a movement. We were told uh, in no uncertain terms not too long ago that foundations don't build movements. And so we had to sort of swallow our pride and say, okay, all right, well, then what can we do to potentiate a movement? Uh, and it's really about trying to create these structures that allow people to use their own ideas and their own kind of initiative uh, to see what motivates them to take it to the next level. So it's about power, it's about policy, and it's about narrative. I think that that's as simple as you can get um, in, in terms of movement building. I encourage people to say, you're wrong, uh, and tell me how we're wrong, because I want to know. I, 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 I want to know. I, I, I need help, um, as we all do, in trying to do this work. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you.